Welcome to Blackstone Book Talks, a podcast featuring exclusive interviews from Blackstone's bookish network of authors, narrators, and special guests. Hello, and welcome to Blackstone Book Talks, Memory, Heritage, and Identity in Fiction. My name is Bella, and I'm so thrilled to kick off our AAPI Month Focus Roundtable. After immigrating to the U.S. from Thailand at, after the age of 12, Serena is the debut author of Reset, a best book of 2021 by Tor.com, and top pick by io9, Gizmodo, Tempest, and Goodreads. Inspired by her experiences growing up with a mother who was incarcerated in a Japanese-American internment camp, Kimiko is the debut author of Block 17, a top pick by Audible, Pop Sugar, Bustle, Chicago Review, and more. We're so excited to have both authors in the virtual hot seat for this discussion. We're going to be diving into the nuances of their works, cultural heritage, intergenerational memories, and how their novels trace the parallels between the past and the present. This is also an extra special round of digital discussion as we are celebrating the one-year book birthday of Reset by Serena Dahlin. Congratulations, Serena. Thank you. I will have cake later. Oh, please save me a piece. <laughs> um, you know, there's going to be a lot of topics we're getting into here, but as always, we're going to be letting the authors take the spotlight for this. And I just wanted to ask, personally, for both of you, before I get off, what is it that you both found inspiring about each other's works? I would love to hear that. I'm really honored to be here with Serena because I love your work so much. Um, I also just wanted to, like, first of all, just acknowledge um, our heavy hearts today. You know, I think it was really hard to um, just, you know, move forward today with the atrocities, um, the horrific atrocities of yesterday's school shooting, um, yet another um, mass shooting in our country. So I don't, you know, have words at all to express um, the enormity of what I'm feeling. But I just wanted to acknowledge that. Absolutely. Uh, this morning, um, I kissed all my kids goodbye. And then, you know, after I told them I love them, I immediately a thought intruded and was like, I hope you don't die. Please don't die. And that's that's been kind of laying heavy in my heart and, and all of the parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles who'd had to send their kids to school today because it's 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 one of those things that we do live with today um and you know we hope to do whatever we can to try to change that yeah the you know i don't want to get into too long of a discussion of it now but just it's ridiculous the that we can't make more sensible gun safety laws in this country and that we teach our kids to fight back and hide and don't do what we can to um, protect them um, at a policy level. So I also just want to acknowledge that today's the two year anniversary of the murder of George Floyd. And so that's another thing that's sort of heavy on our hearts today. So thank you for all of you for being here. Um, and um, yeah, just wanted to take a moment for that. But, um, but yes, yeah, Serena, I, I just wanted to say I have your book right here and congratulations on its one year anniversary. Um, and um, I just really love Reset. Um, it's such a beautifully written and haunting story. Um, I really love how you uh, put, sort of walk that ominous line between utopia and dystopia. Um, throughout. <laughs> and um, I just love all the attention you give to memory and sort of how memory defines us or lack of memory. And for me, I think one of our um, through lines in our works is how uh, we both, both explore how memory and specifically uh, repressed memory, either repressed or oppressed, you know, even erased memories um, still affect and shape who we are. And in fact, become almost the more, more insistent, the more we try to push them away and repress them. Yeah, um, it's exactly the yeah. same thing that resonated, um, you know, with me when I was reading Block 17. It's the fact that oftentimes when we're dealing with trauma, the human mind and our brains are created to do that. Um, we are created to try to put things aside in a neat box and sometimes close that box and put it away so that we can move on with our day-to-day -day living as you know, we often do. And um, what your book does um, is that it kind of, you know, slowly reveal layer by layer 
the negative effect of repressed memories and how they always, always find a way to come out. And so towards the end of the book, you know, it's, it's really about embracing um, the trauma and through it healing, you know, and, and I think that um, that really resonated with me because I think we, we need to stare the monsters in the eyes in order to kind of get through. That's the only way out is to just get through. Yeah, yeah. and I think maybe we were talking about this a little bit the other day, but we both grew up sort of straddling multiple cultures as I think in, in one way or another, we all do in this country. Mm -hmm. um, and I think our interest in sort of fractured identity and mixed identity um, and fluid identity is definitely a through line. Yeah, um, I, I feel definitely that, you know, with, with, with the four cities um, and, and I wrote the four cities as a kind of place that's without race um, because I myself do feel that, you know, I have been living in, in between all my life. And, um, and because of that, I find it comforting. It's a comfort zone to me to be, you know, straddling both places. It's almost like you are, you are, you are not one thing and you're everything and you can at once be both subjective and objective. And I think where you stand in that place where you are not completely attached to an identity, you can see it more truly as what it truly is in its both, in both its beauty and ugliness. And I think that to me is extremely useful as a writer. Yeah, that's, that's, I love how you put that. Yeah, I think we often so much in this culture try to identify with a certain label or a certain, you know, or nationality. And mm -hmm. I think um, it often leads to, you know, division and um, sort of a, a lack of honesty about the, the fluidity of, of who we are. And it creates divisions. Right, because there's, there's no one person that's just, just one thing or another, yeah. you know, everyone is everything um, yeah. in some ways. And when we are forced sometimes to grab onto an identity, um, it can be, um, it can be kind of counterintuitive because at the same time, we have more similarities than we are different, you know? Um, and so in those similarities, I feel it's where we can find a way to live harmoniously. So, yeah. Well, thank you. I wanted to um, start with an, uh, uh, lead with another question here. Um, it's Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Um, so happy AAPI month, everyone. And I wanted to ask, uh, what is the significance of AAPI month for you? Would you like to talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, you know, honestly, I usually forget <laughs> which month it is beforehand. Now it's everywhere. You know, so to me, um, AAPI month to me means representation. It means, you know, it means seeing. It, it's just, you know, when you have representation, when you have it's constantly reminding you, then you kind of like, oh, you know, and it, it serves as kind of like a great opportunity to highlight those within the AIP, AAPI community, but also, you know, the good things and the bad things that we're facing. Um, for me as a writer, you know, I, I love seeing posts about AAPI owned bookstores, uh, books written by AAPI authors. Um, and, you know, moreover, it's just being able to kind of feel like we're all together are celebrating a most almost like a birthday month, you know, um, of course we exist in the other 11 months, but um, this one month it, it's in a way, you know, our, our birthday and we get to kind of have cake and celebrate kind of like Reset's birthday. <laughs> but um, I also though want to point out that it's, it's mental health awareness month. So um, check on your friends and family. Yeah. For me, um, I agree that I love the time, the opportunity to sort of celebrate all the vastly different um, cultures and peoples and histories from throughout Asia and the Pacific Islands. Mm -hmm. And I also just wanna say that I do think as a culture, we need to work towards, um, you know, not sort of assuming or normalizing people and histories and cultures from Europe and kind of thinking that's the, the center and then the other cultures from outside of Europe are sort of on the periphery. Um, I think, 
you know, we need to work on in media and in our education curriculum, sort of more honestly representing the diversity of who we are as America all year around, mm -hmm. all year round. Um, but I do think that, you know, while we don't do that, and while certain histories have been historically underrepresented, it's a great opportunity, like you said, to go deeper. And I love, you know, the opportunity to learn more about my own culture, about other cultures. I love that my two daughters um, in school, like for instance, during Black History Month, I like knowing that they are learning such important histories that have been, you know, left out of, of curriculum for so long. So until right. we do have sort of a more um, uh, organic way of uh, including who we are all year, I, I really do appreciate that time to focus. It can be so hard to focus in our overstimulated environment, so. Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. Um, when we're kind of overstimulated, we're kind of like, wait, here and there and, you know, but um, and definitely. So to pretty much, I, I, I love I love that there's an AAPI month um, so that, you know, I can at the least get to know um, all the other writers and all the stories that are out there because, you know, at the end of the day, the Asian American Pacific Islander experience is not monolithic. You know, we okay. are very different. And, and someone like me who's from another country, that's also, I've grown up with a different experience than someone like Kimiko who grew up here. So, um, so I think it's also in, you know, important and interesting to kind of really look at who we are as a whole human being, as opposed to where we fit, you know, into a little box, because that doesn't usually happen. So, um, but I, I kind of want to go next, Kimiko, to, to your origin story of how you became a writer. Um, where does your story begin? What was like, was there a moment in your life that led to the decision to write about, you know, what you wrote about through fiction? Um, yeah, it's funny. Um, I, I feel like, you know, I was a choreographer for many years and I still am in the dance world somewhat. I still teach um, dance and how to teach dance and theater to kids. Um, so I, before writing my novel, I, um, I explored my heritage and specifically um, the Japanese American incarceration was a subject that I've always been interested in. Um, I explored that through the medium of dance. Um, so through, you know, the body moving through space and time. Um, and even, you know, when I was younger, um, just growing up hearing stories about um, the Japanese American incarceration, which my family called camp at that time. Um, was always sort of interesting to me and confusing to me as a kid. Um, and then in high school, sort of learning a little bit more about what happened, um, more of the facts, um, I started to, it was sort of an in um, dissonance, cognitive dissonance for me to sort mm -hmm. of um, reconcile the, the stories I heard through my family through the injustice that I started learning about. So I, I became very um, sort of obsessed with that topic in a way. And in college, I did a lot of research about it um, and wrote some stories, short stories. Um, but as I said, I kind of took the route of dance a little bit more than writing. Um, so I feel like Block 17 was kind of a natural progression for me to, to want to tell this story um, in a new way through a new medium. Um, yeah, how about you? Um, I, well, I, I was, a corporate person for a very long time. <laughs> and so that was my identity for over 16 years. And then um, back in 2017, the company um, sold and I was asked whether or not I wanted to move to um, another state. And I'm like, you don't ask a Californian that. <laughs> I belong here. So um, I said, no, thank you. And um, with that, I was given the opportunity to kind of explore. And I, um, I took it kind of very similarly to how I took my gap year after college, I explored, you know, and um, I've always wanted to be a writer. Um, I was never a really good one. But I always knew that if I had the time and dedication, I, I can't do that. Um, I don't know. It's just something that I've always been told, you know, if you just put your, your um, hard work in, you can do pretty much almost anything. And um, so I, 
I kind of, you know, started to do that. And then um, funny story. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I've never really gone to see, um, uh, you know, a palmist before, but I did. And I think I was talking to one of my friends and she said, you should see someone and just see what they say. And I was like, all right. So I Googled and found myself a palmist and and paid the person for an hour to read my palm. And uh, he read it for two and a half. And pretty much, you know, I walked out forgetting most of what he said. But the one thing that stayed with me was, you know, if you um, have creativity and, and, and consider it as a gift from the universe or whatever you believe in, and you have to kind of take that and do something with it. Um, because if you don't, it's just going to, you know, be a wasted thing and you're probably going to regret and oftentimes regret what we don't do as opposed to regret what we do. And so I did. That's awesome. <laughs> I love that it, for you, it was kind of this moment <laughs> of sort of an epiphany. That's awesome. I, I want, I was thinking too, as you were talking, I should, I want to acknowledge my parents because my dad was a writer and my mom was a dancer. So I think both of the, you know, their my parents definitely inspired me also to pursue creativity, as you said, like, you know, to, to follow that passion. I Absolutely. was never given the message of, oh, get a practical job. Um, you know, I never encountered that at all, actually, until I got a little older and I saw that other parents weren't necessarily encouraging their kids to become artists. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. Uh, I have a friend whose child wants to write as well. And he's like about my youngest son's age. And, and she's like, yeah, I tell him to try to get another job first and, you know, be like Auntie Serena. She worked for a time. And I was like, yeah, but you know what? You can't say that. You have to kind of just let the person do it and learn. Um, and, and people find a way and everyone just has to honor their own timeline. There's just, you know, there's no one prescribed way of doing anything. But as long as you you keep chasing, chasing yeah. that creativity and chasing that passion. Yeah, I'm a firm believer in following your passion because that's where the energy is. You know, and you don't know exactly how it'll manifest. But I think if you follow your passion, it's definitely going to be fruitful in some way. Absolutely. Because passion is purpose, right? And I think purpose is where we find meaning of yeah. life. Yeah. So um, I wanted to ask you, um, considering it's API month and we're kind of talking about our own heritage and how that influences and inspires us, um, how has your relationship with your heritage evolved over time? Or how, how do you kind of see your relationship with your heritage evolving? Sure, that's a great question. Because um, I grew up Indonesian in a Thai country. So Indonesia is another country that um, completely different than Thailand, different language, different food, um, different religion. So I spoke Thai, you know, outside and, and in the home. But you know, when I'm at home, when I was at home, I had a culture different from my friends. So, so I ate, like I mentioned, I ate Indonesian food um, at weddings and on special occasions, I wore Indonesian outfits, which are very different from Thai. And um, my aunt and my grandmother also spoke Indonesian to each other when they don't want anyone to understand. So, um, so I grew up, you know, like hearing music that's different, hearing languages that are different from, from, you know, the, the regular things that I'm exposed to at school. So I've always felt very much a person of the in-between somewhere, you know, between being Indonesian and Thai. And in moments I embrace being more Indonesian and in moments I embrace being more Thai. And, um, and uh, when I moved here at the age of 12, then, you know, of course I embrace the Californian culture as well. And, um, you know, America is very different um, from Thailand, but also each state is different from another. Um, yeah. And the, the cultures can be very, very different. I came here and I lived in the California desert. And um, that in itself, you know, is, 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 is a trip, you know, because you have all of a sudden this wide space, wide open space, um, sky, you know, that's as blue as you can see. And all of that very much affected me. Um, 
So it, you know, and, and so I kind of embrace this kind of hosh posh of relationship, uh, you know, between cultures and, and languages. And I think in all types of languages and, and like I mentioned after college, I went to, you know, live, um, I went to, um, I took a year off and actually went to do a documentary in my family. Um, and I went back to Thailand and Indonesia. And at that moment, I realized that I also was a very different person than when I first left it 12 years ago. So, so it also kind of made me see that this identity is a very fluid thing. Um, and so I, 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 you know, the affinity that I had with all of these cultures was, there was always constantly changing and moving. Um, and, and also like the places themselves, you know, so in a way I kind of just felt like everywhere was home and nowhere was home. And, and, um, yeah. And I, I, I still feel like that's my relationship with my heritage is still evolving. Mm. Yeah. Well, what about you? Um, yeah, well, I grew up in Berkeley in the seventies, 1970s. So, um, in many ways, you know, it's, it was a very diverse place, very open-minded, uh, place, C compared to say a lot of other, you know, sort of small towns in the United States at that time. But even then I have to say, you know, it was very sort of um, white focused. I mean, I like, I watched the Brady Bunch, you know, <laughs> I didn't see myself on mainstream media at all. So I would say, you know, I kind of wanted to be blonde in a way, you know, I wanted to assimilate. And I, I think I sort of identified more with my, my white side, even though, um, you know, I've always been very close with my mom's side, my who's Japanese, um, and they live down in Los Angeles. So, and I lived up in Berkeley, so I didn't get to see them on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. But I always very much cherished that part of our family and loved them, but didn't get to see them that, that much. Um, but it's funny because when I was little, I used to tell people when they said, oh, what are you? You know, I got that a lot. I think a lot of mixed race people get that, you know, what are you? <laughs> um, and I would say, I had this sort of pat answer. I would say, I'm half Japanese, half Texan. <laughs> um, my dad, you know, coming from Texas, he very much identified with his home state of Texas mm -hmm. and I had been there. Um, and I didn't even really think further than that for him. And he, his family immigrated so long ago from Scotland. Um, and I would love to know more about that side of his heritage uh, or my heritage. Um, but, uh, definitely, as I was saying, like in high school, I started thinking a bit more about my uh, Japanese heritage and um, in college, I started more actively pursuing it more. Um, I interviewed family members um, about whatever they could remember of my bachan, my grandmother, and mm -hmm. um, about their experience during um, World War II. Um, and then my mom and my aunt actually got to um, do sort of a pilgrimage to Japan to see the birthplace, the house where my grandmother came from. Um, and I'm very close with my mom. She lives right downstairs and my aunt. So I feel very uh, connected to my, my Japanese side. And um, I would say my two daughters, um, you know, they're mixed as well, but they, they definitely feel a, a pride and a sense of, um, I think, you know, just love for their Japanese heritage. Um, but I, I really feel what you feel that sort of um, the older I get, the more or the less I guess concerned about um, finding the one place where I belong. I feel very much like I've accepted that I don't really have a homeland <laughs> so mm -hmm. much of what a single place or a single label. And I think I, like you, really sort of embrace that idea of um, the identity of the in-between. Um, yeah. And I think it's, yeah. Yeah, and I almost see like the three countries, America, Indonesia, and Thailand existing right next to each other in my mind. Mm, so I feel yeah. like oftentimes I can just kind of like open the door and go into another one and then come back <laughs> or open another door and go into another one. I, and yeah. I think it's kind of nice because like, especially when it was, it was in Indonesia, you know, it's like people don't have as much high expectation <laughs> on you if you're not part of them because they're just kind of like oh, she's yeah, yeah. American or she's high. <laughs> I'm like that's right. great right. you can get the benefits of kind of being the outsider <laughs> the benefit of, of being an outsider yeah. um, but yeah. like I said you know like being able to kind of look at it both objectively and subjectively at the same time and somewhere in there you can see the the beautiful and the ugliness of of everything, you know, and and yeah. not feel too um, attacked by mm -hmm. those those identity um, 
I don't know, because it's not really, it's all man-made. <laughs> yeah, I also was thinking about this and that, you know, I've always uh, been more attracted to not knowing than knowing. I feel like knowing is kind of this resting static place, whereas that in between not knowing that exploratory state is much more interesting to me because it has so much more potential. Absolutely. I got one question that um, from the audience that I think fits really well um, that we can kind of springboard off of. Corey asked um, to both of us, has your sense of cultural identity shifted since completing these novels? I think I had just mentioned that I, I still feel like my, my identity is constantly shifting mm -hmm. um, and I'm very much a product of the time, you know, um, I wrote Reset as a utopia, I really did, I, I base it off of the lyrics of Imagine, you know, but then as I was writing it and after I finished writing it, I realized someone's utopia is always somebody else's dystopia. And a lot of it has to do with the enforcement of the rules and whether or not you're taking away choice. Because, you know, if we equate choice with freedom and, um, you know, when, when you take that away, like in reset, you remove memories because you don't trust that people are going to um, keep peace because this, the seed of memories is also greed is also that, you know, sense of this strong attachment to things, to people that oftentimes can, um, turn us against each other. And so the planner in creating the four cities, he eliminated memories because, you know, if we, don't have to, we don't have to, um, to kind of wrap ourselves in this sense of, we don't wrap our sense of self with things or other people, then perhaps we can kind of be more present. Um, so, I mean, I guess that's a roundabout way of answering whether or not my cultural identity shifted since I'm cleaning these novels. I, I still feel very much, you know, that same idealistic person. Um, but at the same time, I am, I think, better equipped at trying to see from the side of choice and from the side of, you know, um, different people's experiences, just because, you know, it's, I mean, and, and that's that's what's great about being a reader and a writer. You uh, you get to step, you know, inside someone else's perspective and lives for a little while, and hopefully from there you find some kind of similarities um, that will make you a little bit more empathetic. Um, because I think the worst thing you can be is numb and callous to the plights of others. All of us, you know. Um, our identity always con continues to evolve, you know, the older we get and the more experiences we have. And my experience writing Block 17 was basically, um, as I said, I was a choreographer and teaching dance and not really, not a professional writer at all. So I would write on Tuesday mornings from like 9 a.m. to noon when I dropped my baby off at my parents who generously babysat and enabled me to do this. So it was a very long process. So I had eight years to <laughs> grow during that time. So, mm -hmm. um, but I would say a, a couple of things came to mind, actually. One, I, I do feel, and it's interesting because I think I always thought this intellectually, but I really experienced it with the process of writing Block 17, that, that art heals, because um, I, I wrote the novel to kind of explore these themes of inherited trauma and sort of unconscious and conscious ways that past um, violence or past um, oppression in some ways can, can um, have a ripple effect in ways that we might not even understand. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the process of writing it actually did help me to work through some of that because I no longer feel the need to write that. Like I said, when I was younger, I felt um, sort of obsessed with understanding the Japanese American incarceration and wrote and choreographed about it in these different ways. But through this eight year process, it's not that I'm not still and will always be, I think, interested in, in learning more. And um, I think it's such a, a you know, it's it's an unquantifiable 
um, sort of trauma that happened, but I do feel like the process of writing the story and sharing it and having it heard has been sort of healing with me for me. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one thing. And then another thing I think is I actually just took a really great uh, writing workshop with Matthew Salisis. I'm not sure if you have heard of him. He wrote uh, Disappear Doppelganger, Disappear. I really love his work. He talks a lot about who we're writing for. He wrote a great work on craft called Craft in the Real World that I recommend also. But he talks about, um, you know, who we're writing for, who are our audiences. And I think when I was younger, as I said, as sort of a teenager and a child, I wanted to assimilate with sort of the white mainstream world. And I think I wrote in consciously or not for a white audience in some ways mm. and sort of needed to translate my mixed race experience for what I thought was the sort of mainstream experience. Mm. And I think the older that I get, the less I definitely the less I want to do that. But even and, and then I think when I got a little older, I had an issue of like, am I Asian enough? Like, am I Asian mm. enough to claim Asian American identity because I'm mixed and started out what am I white enough? Am I Asian enough? <laughs> and now I kind of think I'm I'm who I am. You know, we're all um, who we are and we're all a mix of identities. And so I think my urge to, like we said before, label myself and and sort of write for a certain audience has has faded. And now I just really want to try to be as authentic as I can to sort of my own experience and trust that readers will um, relate to some things and won't relate to others, but that sort of that's that's the beauty of it all that we all mm -hmm. are different. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and I'll go back to like our, our um, scheduled questions. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> um, how has your memory affected your sense of self or your identity since we're talking about, you know, memory and identity and, and how has that influenced your novel? Oh, yeah. Well, I love this question. And I, like I said, from the beginning, I feel like that's part of why um, our work so um, is interesting together because we're really dealing with memory. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm really interested in memory, not only, I think we often think of memory as a personal thing because it's like our own memories. Right. We can keep them to ourselves. They're enclosed in our head, <laughs> like in our brain. But I also feel like memory, you know, we're not in a vacuum. And so memory is so cultural and political as well. Mm -hmm. Like I think about what we can remember is partly what we're told, like what we're what we learn in schools. And for instance, with my particular story about the Japanese American incarceration, that wasn't taught in schools for many years. Like I didn't learn about it. So people who didn't have family members go through it couldn't remember it because they never knew about it. Mm -hmm. And then even people who went through it, um, it was so traumatic for some people, especially um, this is an area of the Japanese incarceration that I didn't know much about, but um, many men, community leaders, were um, taken by the FBI before the actual um, camps were built, right after Pearl Harbor. Um, many community leaders were taken, uh, mostly first generation men, and put into these smaller um, detention centers, all male detention centers. Mm -hmm. And very little is remembered about that part of history because the men didn't talk about it afterwards. And we don't know how much it was that the memory was too traumatic to talk about, how much they were just being smart and not talking because they had actually been forced silent by the government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think a mixture of oppressed memories, repressed memories, uh, what we share. So I'm interested in sort of the intersections of all those layers of memory and sort of the gaps of what happened, what we remember and what we um, can express at any time. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's, you know, like me, I, the idea of memories that people can't tend to think that it's a very personal thing. And so it, it becomes our identity, what we remember as a child, what we what happened to us, but um, memory itself is very, very fragile. You know, we tend to think that it's this solid thing, that it's this true thing, but it's it's very fragile. The memories that do stay, stay because um, they are somehow attached to some kind of strong emotions, you know, um, and uh, that's why I don't remember what I ate yesterday, you know, unless it was a really good meal. <laughs> um, so it's, that in itself is subjective. And so in subjectivity, how can we be objective, you know? Um, so, I mean, the way I addressed uh, memories in Reset is to erase it. And in erasing it, the characters have had to try to find and ground themselves in 
places, you know, and I, I see myself very much as a writer of place. Mm-hmm. And a lot of it absolutely has to do with the fact that I don't see myself belonging um, with one identity. And, and, but I do find myself, you know, having affinity with different places. And my, one of my earliest memories is, is of myself, you know, living in my house um, that's in the middle of this kind of the old part of Bangkok. And it was an antique house, a really old house. And um, that in itself has, you know, just the city itself and the house itself, there's a lot of memories that comes, you know, that come with those. Um, and so, it, you know, it, I, I felt that, you know, being, being um, a, a diverse person growing up in a house, in a place with long memories, um, that's where I find my identity. And I, I feel like, the characters in my book do that as well. You know, the, the cities, there are four different cities and each city has its own personality in some ways. And the people in it were um, assigned to these places based on their propensity. You know, someone yeah. who um, has a kind of scientific predilection like Eris um, has to work, you know, has to be in a city where she has those places that um, or she has to work at a certain place or someone who's artistic would rather fit in a place that is less structured like Alara. Um, so I, I, you know, I, so very much, you know, place is very much a character for me and I ground my characters in those places just as I ground myself in the different places um, that I've been and that I found to be home. That's great. This kind of maybe um, piggybacks on that, but um, the next question I was going to ask is, can you talk a little bit about your storytelling, both your technique and your process, and how that manifests in this novel? Oh, gosh, Uh, this was my first book. So I was, I didn't have a process. I was discovering writing, how to write plot characters, how to like at the same time. So it was very much, you know, um, it was very much kind of like this posh, posh of experiences. I pants half of the book or maybe no, one third, one third of the book. And it means like, um, as a writer, you are, they, they say, they say you either a pantser or a plotter, you either plot very specifically and you write like extensive outlines and, um, you know, and you have like a whiteboard and, and I'm not that, not for the first third, because I feel like I don't know who these people are. Um, I need to first know who they are. I need to know what drives them. I need to know their likes and dislikes. And I can't really do that um, by forcing my personality on them. They have to kind of just happen and they tell me, um, you know, what they like, what they don't like, how they would react. And from there, I get the stories. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, I I very much, and I've had to learn to be okay with it, because I think as a writer, you want so much to like, have a handle on the story. But it's a fluid thing, You, you know, it changes all the time, because in an 80,000, 90,000 word book, you take, you know, oftentimes months, if not years writing this and you as a person change um, during those times. So, you know, you have to kind of, you kind you have to kind of, at least for me, grow with the characters, grow with the story. Um, I'm writing a story right now that I wrote back in 2019. And um, I'm rewriting it and I found that I like it better because in the past, you know, three years, I've learned more and I've become more and now my characters are more interesting. So um, yeah, what about you? It's nice to think that writing, we can get better with age. It dances a little different and we we can, but (laughs) certain things don't get better with age. Um, I think a lot of what you said really resonates with me. It was my first novel, Block 17, so I didn't really have a process either. And like I said, I I did it in such little short blips over Mm. such a long time. So I don't plan on doing that again. I don't plan on taking (laughs) it again. 
Um, but I like when I first showed my rough draft to a good friend of Block 17, he was like, oh, it you know, has a lot of great things in it, but really nothing happens. And I was like, oh, you know, <laughs> uh, plot was something that I had to, it was very much theme based and character based and, mm -hmm. and a lot of, um, you know, um, sort of symbolism going on for me. Um, and I think I had to kind of step back and remember that, you know, you need a plot. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I think, um, but I, I, you know, getting back to what we we're talking about, sort of mixed and fractured identity, I think the way that that theme for me manifests um, sort of structurally is, um, in my writing so far is that I like to play with linear time. I like to kind mm. of fracture that or sort of disrupt that, that sort of traditional story arc mm -hmm. um, as a way to kind of get at that sense of um, fluid memory, like you've been talking about fractured identity. Yeah. And then also I really have found that I, um, cause I'm working on my second novel now, I really like um, playing with unreliable narrators. I'm really attracted to works as a reader. Um, Kazuo Ishiguro is one of my favorite authors. And yeah. he, I think is sort of a master at having narrators who we always sense there's something that's not being uh, acknowledged to themselves and to mm -hmm. us. And for me, again, that's another way, um, not necessarily that I try to do that, but I'm finding that um, something about that gap between what's being told and what, what is, is really interesting to me. Oh, I, I love that too. Actually, that my second book preset, the one that um, is coming out next year, I played with that. I played the heck out of that mm -hmm. um, because I feel like you can be really, you can really explore memory. And because like we both said, memory is just so subjective, you know, and even, even though we take it as truth, it's so subjective and it can be twisted and it can, and we oftentimes will the lies we tell ourselves <laughs> become a new truth. And that in itself is so fascinating, you know? Yeah. So um, next question. This one's interesting. Um, what's your take on the model, model minority stereotype? Mm. Um, yeah, I think like any stereotype, you know, I, I sort of, reject it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I feel like it wasn't created by, like all stereotypes, it wasn't created by uh, people who are ascribed that label. You know, I think in this case, we're talking about Asian Americans. Um, it was very much put on, I think, by, um, you know, it, it, I think implicit in the, the term model minority is this sort of idea that there is good minorities and then there's bad minorities. Mm -hmm. And then there's this sort of hierarchy of race um, in our country with, you know, white, white people at the top. And then, and then I think it's been sort of this almost like threat to Asian Americans. Like if you're, if you're good, if you don't, you know, rock the boat, if you don't find allegiance with other minority groups, you know, if you don't find allegiance with black Americans or Latinx Americans or indigenous Americans, um, and you kind of, um, you know, as I said, sort of play by these certain rules, you can get a little closer to the top of this hierarchy. So I think it's a very divisive term and it's a very false contract. I don't think there's truth to that contract, but I think um, rather than um, finding commonalities and finding um, you know, empowerment, the term just very much, um, it's also very homogenizing, like it very just flattens uh, people um, and it is not at all representative of mm -hmm. any group of people. But uh, mostly for me, it conjures that that sort of hierarchy, um, and that's sort of the main reason that I I reject it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. For me, um, I I love words, so you know, and I love like finding out why we 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 call certain things certain things because mainly, you know, we use like it's very human to come with come up with descriptions for things like colors the sky the ground um it's how we identify you know we use we use words as shorthand so that you know we all as a community speaking the same language can kind of say oh if we say one thing it means this we don't have to kind of be labor um, but the problems that I find, you know, with words also is that we, we often tie words to emotions. Um, and if the emotions are negative, then you get racism and hatred. And if the emotions are positive, you get loyalty and understanding like 
family and love and community. Um, but if emotions are mixed, um, you can get something passive aggressive. And I think minor yeah. model minority falls into this bucket of being passive aggressive. Um, because like you said, it's, it's, it's a word that's not created by the person being called it, right? I would never call myself a model minority. Um, so it's, it's, it's somewhat, you know, it's an assignment of a non-threatening tag, but to someone it's still perceived to be different um you know and and it's it's a word used to describe when someone feels it's the other because like none of my friends would call me model model minority you know what i mean it's no one is going to you know i i would be serena um and that i think is true of of everybody once we kind of cease to see another person as the other they just become themselves um so yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, I have another question. Um, do you feel that the publishing industry is moving toward more diverse storytelling? And what can publishers um, and the world do better to foster cross cultural solidarity work? Mm, okay. So <laughs> um, I think. The publishing industry is a business. Um, and as a business, you identify market, right? And you attach spending power to that market. Um, I feel like the need for diverse storytelling has always been there. And it's always kind of been pent up within certain groups and these groups have spending power. And so we're now seeing um, stories created or written um, by, you know, certain groups for certain groups, perhaps, um, because of all of these pent up spending power. And I feel like, you know, it's, it's, the shift is a natural reaction to understanding the market. Um, unfortunately, it, it took a long time to get here. But um, I feel also that we are now seeing more and more diverse stories told by um, people of various backgrounds. And I love that um, because, you know, I think all of these stories um, have so much value. And um, because like I said, you know, it's like, there's no one monolithic way of, of being um, like an Asian story can mean so many things. Um, you know, I grew up in, in, in Thailand and I grew up on translated Japanese books. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so the stories I grew up with were very much, you know, just everyday story, you know, it's just a person writing a story. It's just kind of like, you know, if you go to Thailand and you order Thai food, you don't call it Thai food. You just call it food. <laughs> <laughs> it's just life, you know? So, um, I am hoping to see more of those just life stories of just being and not having to go, look at me, this is me, you know, um, it's just life. I would love very much to, to you know, to have more stories like that. Yeah, I think so often we feel, we were talking about this a little bit the other day, but, you know, um, the um, works from people from without um, other cultures than Europe are often tokenized or like, you know, oh, if it's Asian American story, it has to have like a rice paper lantern in it. Or, you know, mm. there's like these little <laughs> markers that, like you said, they're just not human, right? They're not considered human. And I think for me, I do see the publishing industry as um, working towards being more representative. I'm seeing so many wonderful works from people of different backgrounds getting published. Um, but I know for myself, it took me a long time to find an agent for this story. Finally, I found my amazing agent um, who really believed in it. Um, but I think, you know, there's kind of like these gatekeepers with the publishing industry. Um, and of course, they're trying to sell as many books as they can, which is, you know, sort of their job. Um, but I think until we get more um, people of diverse backgrounds uh, in the publishing industry itself, so edit, you know, acquiring editors, developmental editors, agents, uh, more people of diverse backgrounds within the industry, only then will it really change. Otherwise, it's going to be kind of filtered through a very narrow lens. Um, so I think that's, for me, that's what we need to work towards is just having more people of more backgrounds 
um, in the industry and not having sort of a tokenized one, one Asian person here, you know? Mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a, that kind of leads to a question that I got from the audience from Shannon. Hi, Shannon. I know Shannon. <laughs> what do you think of writers who are not Asian, for example, writing with an Asian perspective? Because I think you can definitely run into problems with trying to represent something that you don't know. Um, that being said, I think writing comes from our imagination. And I can, if I only wrote about people who were me, it would be a very boring, boring story, right? It would just wouldn't be um, fiction. So you, we have to put ourselves in the minds and bodies in a way of other people, of a man or of somebody of this different background or this different orientation. So mm -hmm. I definitely don't feel that we can only write about our immediate lived experience. But I do think that we have to be careful, especially in a world where historically certain groups have been misrepresented, like say with that model, model minority term, mm -hmm. all these term, all these stereotypes. I think we have to look at that context and so be very careful if we're trying to represent a group that's being un, has been historically underrepresented. I think we have to be careful for with speaking for that group. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... That's such a great answer. Um, I would only add that, I mean, I write from different perspectives all the time. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the benefits, you know, to me of being a person in between, you can kind of move in and out. Um, and um, however, you know, I, I would say that there is a consequence to words, right? Um, because words are powerful. And um, understanding understand um the consequence that there could be consequences can help you try to find a way to um kind of you know find a way to to get sensitivity readers or people like try to do more research essentially you know protect yourself by doing a lot of research by arming yourselves with people with those perspectives you're trying to represent so that you're not writing in this isolation. Um, you can, I absolutely believe in, you know, wholeheartedly in, you should be able to write whatever you want to write, but there will be consequences and, and doing a lot of research and arming yourselves with people from those perspectives will help you. Um, make sure that you know at least you know when you're asked certain questions as to why did you write that you have an answer and you can support it and you can um essentially own that story in a way serena i know we have a few more questions but we're running out of time oh there, i was thinking is the, it almost um, two? Oh my goodness yeah. this is so fun <laughs> Ask the question. It's a darker question, I guess, but about the anti-Asian violence. Do you mind if we jump to that one? Is that okay? Um, yeah, of course. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I wanted to, you know, just acknowledge that there's been this huge rise recently in anti-Asian violence, and it's had a profound impact on the AAPI community. And just to ask you, um, where do you find strength and resilience in these times, and how can we better support one another? Well, um, I've always felt that success is the best revenge. <laughs> so, you know, live your truth, um, lift up others, uh, write your words, uh, tell your stories, you know, um, because I think with representation and with words that are your own, the more that it's out there, the more you can kind of help um, not just lift up each other within the community, but kind of expose uh, others you know, who may not have experiences with someone like you um, to kind of get to know you. And so, like I said before, not of my friends would call me a model minority. Um, and because of that, I think that empathy does get transferred um, when you know someone who have that story. So please, you know, put yourself out there, understand how your votes can affect change. Um, vote, vote, vote. <laughs> um, because yeah, you, you need to kind of get your stories out there and get the truth out there. What about you? 
Yeah, um, I think I agree with everything that you've said. And um, I think for me, where I find strength and resilience, you know, today it was really hard to think about, <laughs> you know, moving forward with such just kind of uh, unimaginable, uh, mindless, your senseless violence and horror. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I genuinely do find strength and resilience from um, all the young people that I'm around. I have, I have kids, um, I teach um, at Cal State East Bay. So I'm around all these young people and I, I really am amazed at like how um, brilliant they are and how thoughtful so many young people are right now about so many issues that um, when I was younger, weren't being talked about nearly as much. And I think, um, I'm really inspired by young people um, not being afraid to talk about hard issues, not being afraid of that in between um, the kind of uh, gray areas in between black and white. Um, and you know, one thing that I've been thinking about, and it actually, um, I was thinking about it a lot today with in terms of our work and, and sort of memory, um, all the violence in our culture, you know, that we're so inundated with violence here in this country. And I think a lot about how, you know, violence in the past finds its way into the present moment in conscious and unconscious ways. And I think about how our country was founded on, you know, the genocide of Native American people. And so much of our early wealth was built um, uh, on, you know, the enslavement of African people, kidnapped African people. So, so much violence sort of at the inception of our country that I feel hasn't been fully acknowledged, even though we know about it, we learn about it. But I think a lot about how my family um, who underwent the Japanese American incarceration received reparation. And that reparation, while it could never, you can never put a price tag on trauma <clears throat> or even the financial losses exactly, it was something very profound. And when I think about, um, you know, um, the, the hundreds of years of oppression that, um, indigenous people in this country and, and um, descendants of, of enslaved people in this country have undergone by the government, I think that reparations are, are really needed um, in order to sort of start the healing um, from past violence um, in order to sort of, <clears throat> yeah, I guess, um, heal and really sort of formally acknowledge past violence in order to deal with um, the ways it still that violence kind of seeps through to today in our country. Mm -hmm. So that's something I wanted to kind of put out there. Yeah, I think other countries have done things like that where, you know, in Germany, they've very much acknowledged the, you know, the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. um, in, you know, the Netherlands, they very much acknowledged that they took part in 500 years of, of you know, colonizing Indonesia. Um, I, I definitely think, like I said before, that, you know, we have to learn to teach ourselves to look at the monsters in the eye, because the only way out is through. And the more you kind of say, oh, no, that didn't happen. It's kind of like telling someone who experienced a trauma that didn't happen. Just move on. Right. Sure. It's easy for you. <laughs> it's not easy for the other person. And we know that trauma has a way of seeping out. Um, and, you know, so a lot of times, you know, just talk about it, talk about it, acknowledge it, and heal together. Because I think, you know, the idea of victimhood, um, it's uncomfortable on both sides, I think, to acknowledge. Um, but I think we can acknowledge what happened without acknowledging that it is something that we can't shake off. Um, so, you know, kind of like there's, there's, there's a way for all of us to move forward if we would just talk and not bury things because yeah, right. as your book had shown yeah, well, and same, same <laughs> drama like comes know. out yeah and exactly. like reset yeah. too yeah exactly. come out yeah they find yeah. a way out you can't you can't erase the past and in fact mm -hmm. it it insists on itself if we it don't. insists on itself um, it will come out and you have to deal with it one way or another mm -hmm. so might as well deal with it in the bravest way possible which is to kind of go let's look at it let's look at it together and let's see what we can do did you want to like we can maybe talk for one more minute do you want to talk a little bit about your next project 
Oh, sure. Um, so I, I finished preset, the prequel to reset, um, in the middle of February. And, um, it's a beast of a book (laughs) that took me three years to write. And I cried over it so much, but I think it may be the best book I've ever written. So I'm really excited. I can't wait. Yeah. I'm really excited to to share it. it. Um, it's supposed to come out May of next year, but this um, paperback version of Reset, I had asked um, our friends at Blackstone and they happily helped me to include the first chapter of Preset in, um, in this book. So this one is coming out in September. So um, if you want to kind of get a sneak peek of Preset, it's here. Um, but yeah, I, I'm really excited about it. How about you? You said you mentioned, you mentioned that you're writing something. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, my family, uh, my aunt, um, and different family members were smart enough to interview my grandmother, um, before she passed away many years ago about her life story. And she spoke in Japanese, but we've had them translated recently. So I'm writing a novel that's very loosely based on her, um, life story. And one, one thing that's been really fun for me is I'm finding myself really fascinated with um, a certain time and place, which is Hollywood during the 1920s, but looking at the Japanese American um, experience at that time and looking at little Tokyo and a theater community that was there that I never knew anything about. Um, so that's an exciting time for me that I'm really having fun sort of finding ways to bring it to life. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Yeah. I can't wait. Yeah, well, same. Thank you so much for, um, you know, just doing this conversation. It's just so fun to get to talk to you about your work. I can't believe an hour just flew by. (laughs) So, yeah, no, I I love your book, like I said, and I I cannot wait to read more from you. Oh, same, same. Yeah, I'm really excited about about Preset. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Thank you. Serena and Kamiko, I mean, I said it already, but I want to thank you for lending your time and leading this panel and allowing such a personal glimpse into not just your works, but also your perspectives on cultural representation, inclusive storytelling, and how people can do better with sharing these stories. And it was just really beautiful to hear how you find strength while honoring your experiences, your process, your timeline, a lot of important messages there. And you're absolutely right in words harnessing power. And we definitely can't wait to see what stories you're gonna be inspiring us with next. Um, You can learn more about the authors and where to purchase their current and future releases by heading to our website at blackstonepublishing.com. Thank you so much. Thank you to Blackstone and to you for hosting us. This is a great experience. I'm so glad. Yeah. And thank you everyone for coming today. Even though we can't see you out there. <laughs> I know. You with us. Thank you. Thank you. And I will think of you all when I have cake tonight. Yes, please. <laughs> I wasn't kidding about that slide. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also going to get a drink that um that um Elias made for reset that's inspired by reset. Yes, so I'm Elias getting Ellis. some of that tonight too. <laughs> Celebrations all Love around. Share, your, share the recipe with us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I hope you guys have a great rest of your day and thank you all for tuning in. We'll see you guys again soon. Thanks for listening to Blackstone Book Talks with Blackstone Publishing. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review. To catch all the latest bookish news from Blackstone, you can follow us on Instagram at Blackstone Publishing, on Twitter and Facebook at Blackstone Audio, or on our website at blackstonepublishing.com. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.